All right, so it's currently 12.05 a.m. on Sunday, October 16th, which leaves about three hours and 55 minutes before the UN-brokered ceasefire between Gaza and Israel completely expires. This was basically done so that Israel could check a box and say, hey, we allowed the humanitarian corridor, the safe passage from the north to the south for approximately six 100,000 people because, of course, we turned off all the utilities and then we turned the water back on in the south, knowing that after a few days without water, their survival instincts would kick in. So they'd all have to go down to the south anyways. Now we're going to lay the north to waste. They're going to completely annihilate the north. There will be no buildings left standing because the IDF is incredibly casualty averse. They're not going to risk the casualties of more than a few hundred soldiers, I don't think, which is why they're going to completely level that place. And that includes likely bunker busters in order, so they can get right down into those tunnels that Hamas is notorious for, the hundreds of miles of tunnels in the Gaza Strip. At the same time, you're going to have the egress of foreign nationals out of the country on the southern border with Egypt. And they're also going to be allowing the safe passageway of around 100 semi-loads of supplies that the two million Palestinians are going to need, which is not going to be anywhere close to meeting the demands of those two million people. But again, it's all about checking a box. They simply don't care at this point, much like many of the Muslim countries of the world who don't want to accept Palestinians as refugees. Now, there are reasons for that. One of the reasons being is that they don't want to give tacit approval to the occupation if they take in Palestinian refugees and the refugees just keep coming and there's no more Palestinian people in what used to be known as Palestine to some people, then there is never going to be any Palestine. And I think there's probably some political utility in having this conflict rage on in Israel for Muslim countries as well. And we're going to get into that. But understand, after the egress of all these people from the north to the south is going to be completely annihilated. Hezbollah is likely going to enter the war. The United States is going to counter Hezbollah. Hezbollah is going to start shooting anti-ship missiles at the strike carrier groups. It's possible. It sounds far out. Lots of people don't know about Hezbollah, that they are a formidable fighting force. They took the IDF to task in 2006. Go and study that conflict. This is not going to be where they get completely ratioed like Hamas is currently getting ratioed or has historically gotten ratioed. It's almost kill for kill when it comes to a Hezbollah fighting force versus an IDF fighting force. They know the terrain. They are very well trained. They are very well armed. They have over 100,000 rockets. They have thousands of short-range ballistic missiles, anti-ship missiles, artillery. They have a lot of firepower. They also have the backing of Iran who is recruiting hundreds of thousands of people, as well as Syria, as well as various groups in Iraq, all of which do not like Israel, as well as some Muslim countries who were at one point in normalization talks with Israel, but because of the plight of the Palestinians, and this is why this has been a complete PR disaster for Israel, and even if they completely win this one-sided battle, they are going to completely wipe the floor with Hamas. There's some people saying that, well, it's, you know, it might drag out, it might be the next Bakhmut, even I thought about that, but when I re recall how casualty-averse Israel is, they're likely just going to completely destroy the place first, leave no stone unturned for uh, guys to hide in there. Then they're going to go in with their ground forces and eradicate everything that remains. Who knows what sort of tactics, uh, not approved under international law, they are going to utilize. And they're going to go in there and they're going to, from their perspective, get the job done. But what this is going to do, this is going to create great anger within the Muslim community, Sunni or Shiite, across the Arab world. And if Arab leaders don't do something to side with the Palestinians, their opposition will politically leverage that against them, which is why you may even see countries like Saudi Arabia, countries like Saudi Arabia who are currently about to do military exercises with the Chinese, okay? Countries like Iran, countries like Qatar, they may well be forced to support the Palestinians in some capacity beyond just doing lip service. Now ask yourself this question. 
if you really take a look at the big picture about what's going on here, you had that Russian conflict, which is still ongoing. It is still raging. And in fact, it's starting to trend up again. I have some new information. Zelensky said that he anticipates a wholesale bombardment of the Russians to start any day now, and it's going to be wild. We also have a full-scale mobilization happening in Ukraine. You do not hear about this stuff on the mainstream media any, anymore. But just understand that prior to all of this, and what has been happening over the last two years? You've had BRICS, the emergence of BRICS. BRICS is very important because you've had the Saudis become giving the United States the cold shoulder, becoming very cocky about the petrodollar, becoming very flippant about the importance of U.S. international hegemony. And as all of this support in the Middle East is starting to wane, suddenly we have this flare up of stuff in the Middle East. And all of a sudden you have the movement of military force back into the Mediterranean and the Persian Gulf. It could very well be that the United States situating its military in these regions is just the tip of the spear for what might be coming, setting the stage for some sort of greater presence in the Middle East in order to offset this drift towards the East that the Middle East has been experiencing for the past two years. Case in point, I was reading an article today, apparently around the Syria-Iraq border, which is large, on certain corridors on the eastern border, there was some mysterious... American military activity. That's what it was referred to as because people were wondering why are the Americans all heading towards the eastern border of Iraq with Syria? Large convoys of vehicles heading in that region. Well, today we find out that Iran actually has met with the leader of Hamas and an Israeli official revealed that Iran is trying to move strategic weapons through Syria in order to open a second war front. We've seen videos of these convoys not only coming from Iran, we're talking about heavy equipment, tanks, artillery, as well as convoys of more ragtag militia groups by the looks of things from Iraq. Now, Hezbollah is going to be the most formidable fighting force, as I've already said, going up against 100,000 Hezbollah fighters compared to the 1,000 that they went up to in 2006 and they got their asses hand to them. Now you have a more well-equipped Hezbollah. This is why the American uh, uh, aircraft carrier is there. And if they go to war with Lebanon, the entirety of the Muslim world could erupt and this is when we're really going to see that inflection point for civil unrest throughout all Western countries around the world. We're talking about a 9-11 a rerun of sorts, a war on terror 2.0. Okay, now we're going to be cut across one of the final most divisive of dividing lines, and that is the line of religion. The one that all the eschatologists around the world get excited about. Unfortunately, this is nothing to be excited about. I had my friend Steve from the Wholesale Freeze-Dried Food Company on a month ago. He was telling us that the U.S. embassies are all stocking up because they anticipate shit hitting the fan. Well, this is shit hitting the fan, okay? So, we've had Hezbollah cross fire between Israel. Israel today targeted the airport in Aleppo. Once again, they're bombing the Syrian airport day after day because they're concerned that weapons are being flown in or perhaps they're trying to intervene. They're trying to make sure that whatever sort of uh, negotiations and human intelligence is being sent cannot be uh, sent as easily because one of the failures they are saying in the incompetence of the IDF in identifying what Hamas has pulled off here in recent weeks is that Hamas had good analog intelligence, human intelligence that was not trackable by surveillance, okay? Unless you go and bug a guy or unless you have human informants, which in some capacity the IDF does have that, but apparently it's not as good and Hamas was able to just keep their mouth shut and that's how they pulled this off. Now, We've had guests on who disagree with that. We've had guests on who 
claim that, you know, this just shouldn't have been the case. Guess who partook in the IDF on their uh, conscription, you know, mandatory service that they all have to go through, who claim that it's almost impossible for them to have pulled this off. Some people think that demeans Hamas's efforts and it underestimates the enemy. I'll let you be the judge of that. But what we have here is the makings of a massive conflict. And the fact that Israel, like I said yesterday, has so many nuclear facilities throughout the country, these may be prime strategic targets for Hezbollah. Hezbollah has some heavy firepower. And while we might think that, well, the IDF has a lot of trained soldiers, they have a lot of firepower, they have the U.S., at their back well all this is true and i've made some comments on twitter that kind of talk about how imbalanced this fight is and how sometimes the west likes to play on easy mode that's why they're not really helping out ukraine because the russians are a force to be reckoned with and they're getting their asses handed to them so they want to play on easy mode again they want that full spectrum air dominance and you know just calling the airstrikes that good old american type war well this might not be as easy especially if Hezbollah is able to, and the, the Iranian Axis, is able to muster some good anti-aircraft firepower. Then it might not be so easy, but I guess time will tell. Either way, Israel is about to start some shit. Blinken told Israel, please don't preemptively attack Hezbollah, implying that there was a plan to preemptively strike Hezbollah. What this is going to mean is this is going to put Hezbollah on edge. Is this just to <clears throat> put Hezbollah on notice? One thing I will advise is one of the first rules of war is to never, ever take anything they say literally. I hear a lot of people say, oh, well, Joe Biden suddenly cares about, you know, the Palestinian humanitarian crisis. Okay, is he saying that because it's now politically useful? Oh, uh, you know, the Iranian foreign minister said, well, we're not going to intervene unless... Uh, Israel attacks us or our interests. Okay, if you want to take that literally, that's not what they said yesterday. And what do they mean by their interests? You don't think Israel and the United States, who've already attacked, uh, you know, nuclear scientists, generals, even facilities in Iran, you don't think that they're potentially going to do that again if they feel that this is an existential crisis for them. And this is something to keep in mind, because if this gets to the point of it being an existential crisis for Israel, for whatever reason, for whatever motive, a modus operandi, Hezbollah, Lebanon, who distances themselves from Hezbollah, that's a weird relationship I don't really understand, or Syria or the surrounding countries who don't like being policed by Israel, and that's their primary role, is to be the Western proxy that has nuclear weapons that keep all the Arabic countries in line. Let's just get real. That's what they're there for, okay? So if that is at risk of collapsing, Israel will absolutely use nuclear weapons. There is some very extremist radical types in the Israeli parliament in the Israeli government who are already calling for the use of nuclear weapons in order to minimize casualties, okay? So this is, this is not something that is uh, beyond the realm of possibility, and it's something being discussed. And if there's any place that is likely going to do it, it's probably going to be them. Everybody's talking about nuclear this, nuclear that. Russia is not going to just start lobbing nukes because Israel attacks Syria. It doesn't work that way. There has to be some existential risk to Russia for them to want to use nuclear weapons. Now, what this will do is put every other country on a heightened state of nuclear alert if Israel does use nuclear weapons. And for all we know, the Iranians and the North Koreans and the Russians, the three most heavily sanctioned countries on Earth, have already provided the Iranians with the technology that they need to quickly manufacture nuclear weapons if they don't already have them already. So it is very difficult to say. But understand that the Lebanese government, even though they distance themselves from Hezbollah, they will be held accountable according to Israel. And Israel is speaking really on behalf of the United States. So what that means is that the United States will possibly seek some kind of regime change in Lebanon, destabilize that region. Who knows what's going to happen? Will they start attacking, attacking the Lebanese military, and I really have to do more research. If any of you guys have 
good intel on the relationship between the Lebanese military and Hezbollah. I would be interested in knowing. Maybe we'll try to get a guest on here to break that all down. But Lebanese Foreign Affairs Minister Abdullah Buhabib says the government has absolutely no control over Hezbollah despite having positions uh, positive relations with them. Israeli's defense minister said today that Lebanon is responsible for everything happening on its territory. Okay. Now, according to Iran's UN mission, Iran's armed forces will not engage Israel provided it does not dare to attack Iran. It's interest nationals, Iran's UN mission, but uh, Iran's defense minister has said that Iran will be forced to respond if Israel invades Gaza. What does respond mean? Well, they're going to have to respond because if they don't, they're going to have to answer to their own people. A theocracy gains its legitimacy from its defense of the religion which it claims to represent. And if they don't do that and they just rest on their laurels, then their people are going to be coming to them with pitchforks because for a lot of people within that society, uh, that is one of the central focuses of their lives, is their religion. And so there are people who do uh, have compassion for the Palestinian people as much as the upper echelons of those societies, be they the House of Saud or the Ayatollah, as, as much as they might not actually care for the Palestinians, the people do, and that's what matters. Otherwise, Iran is going to have a bunch more protests and uh, COINTEL type endeavors that they're going to have to deal with. All right. So according to the IDF, Hezbollah is acting under the instructions of Iran to escalate the situation in the north and challenge Israel while it fights Gaza. But Blinken says, don't worry, Israel, we got your back. Well, guess what? That aircraft carrier is in range of Hezbollah's anti-ship missiles. So shit could go sideways real quick and nobody really knows what Turkey's going to do tomorrow. And uh, apparently they're sending warships down there for exercises. So who really knows? The Palestinian Authority has denounced Hamas. Okay, Mahmoud Abbas stated today, if you don't know the geography, the West Bank, the Gaza Strip, basically the West Bank is the more, uh, I don't want to say westernized, but they're the ones who have acquiesced to the demands of the occupying force that is Israel. And uh, it's, it's benefited them in terms of gross domestic product, but a lot of people uh, think they sold out. Anyways, I'll leave you to be the judge of that. But some people are saying that he's saying this for political purposes, and this is just to show you the difference of opinion between people in Gaza Strip and uh, you know the occupied West Bank as well. So... According to a poll, 78% of people in the United States support what Israel is doing right now. That is very significant because that is what is going to dictate policy. As long as that number doesn't get to the 50% mark like we've seen with Ukraine as of recent, which I think that one could tick up once again if the media decides to focus on it once again. The power of the media is absolutely immense. If the media decides to make it front page news once again, everybody will be talking about it like clockwork, clockwork, clockwork. When it's instrumental for the deep state, they will make it happen. They will make people interested. What's likely going to happen, I'm just going to jump ahead a little bit here, because what's likely going to happen is Zelensky said in an evening video message that Russia is preparing to bomb the entire Ukraine energy system in the near future, and this is why they're saving all their missiles. There hasn't been many airstrikes into Ukraine for the last three weeks. Well, there's actually a few today, but that was the first time in three weeks, and he called on NATO countries to provide Ukraine with even more air defense systems to combat this. Now, they're also doing full-scale mobilization in Ukraine. They've already mobilized all the women. The Ukrainian Ministry of Defense demanded that all those liable for military service independently report to the territorial recruitment centers. So man, it is getting hot in Ukraine. It's about to get bad in Ukraine. Europe needs another record-breaking warm winter this year to prevent a major full-scale economic crisis. If this Middle East crisis flares up, and the price of oil goes sky high. Could you imagine the strain on the European energy sector 
now that there's been now that we got hybrid warfare going on in the Baltic with that natural gas pipeline that was mysteriously taken out, they're blaming it on Russia, but the uh, jury's still out on that. Anyways, that could be absolute devastation for Western economies. Maybe not the United States as much because they do have some domestic oil production. They also have the strategic oil reserve, which will be completely depleted if uh, the aforementioned occurs, but uh, it's not gonna be good. And this indicates that that war is getting ready to heat up and we may very well see the collapse of Ukraine. Now you have a Polish government which is divided. How is that going to play into, into some people's hypothetical annexation of Western Ukraine by Poland or some sort of NATO coalition or, or non-NATO coalition force so they don't have to invoke Article 5 so they can go in there with some group of uh, troops into the West and annex that part of the territory. What is that going to look like? I don't know. But apparently, going back to the Middle East, IRGC troops, Iranian Revolutionary Guard troops, are recruiting hundreds of thousands of people in order to fight in this possible war. So they've also been doing exercises uh, in the, what is it called? Not the Strait of Hormuz. Is it the Arabian Sea? I think it's the Arabian Sea. I could be wrong about that. But uh, they've been doing military exercises out there as well. So, we got the Israeli ambassador to the U.S. saying that it will not occupy the Gaza Strip after the war. We have no desire to occupy or reoccupy the Gaza Strip, he says. We have no desire to rule over the lives of two million Palestinians. Of course, we just want them gone. That's it, right? We just want to, uh, you know, you know, you know, right? Yeah, those of you who know, you know. So, some people are saying that this is because there's natural materials there, resources, natural gas, oil, but the paltry amount of natural gas there, I think they're talking about one trillion cubic feet off the coast of the Gaza Strip. To put in perspective, Russia has 1,600 trillion cubic feet of natural gas, and it's far more accessible. The United States has around 600. Canada has around 1,200. Okay, Iran has around 1,000. So it's really, to me, that's not really the motive here. Uh, it's probably more of we just want them out. Maybe there is some benefits. You know, some people think this prophecy thing, they want to build the third temple, so they got to knock some stuff down. I don't know enough about that. Is that a true, pure motive for these people? I don't really know. I think that that's... I don't think that the people in charge, even the, the ones who, who claim to be evangelicals, I don't even think they truly believe it in the way that their believers do. I think that it's instrumental for them to get rich. And I don't think they truly believe it though. Maybe they do, but, uh, and I could be wrong about this, but I think they, they kind of leverage people's beliefs in order to control people. But that's just my personal opinion. Every time I say my opinions on here, it gets me in trouble. So I'm just gonna give the news. We already have some, uh, how would you call it, religious violence happening in the United States, okay? We have stabbings in China. We had a stabbing in France recently. We had a, a guy in Chicago who recently apparently stabbed some kid who was Muslim or something like that. So we are going to see incidents like this increase. We're likely going to see the price of ammunition increase. We're going to see a pandemic 2.0 in terms of panic buying pretty soon here and if you've stuck around this far in the video i want to let you guys know that we have three skids of the last arcopia freeze-dried smoothies not the last but this is the last of this particular kind they're being discontinued these last 25 years these are fruit smoothies we've done videos on them before the this is from a local business and uh, it's just a pound of freeze-dried fruit fruit and they are actually going to be moving towards a smaller size which based on their market research people prefer because you can make it in the bag but we still have the one pound of fruit variants in the 12 packs again last 25 years i'm going to be doing a video on this but if you mix this with your 20 year powdered milk you have a mad max power drink 
It's gonna provide all of your micro and macro, macronutrients. It tastes delicious, and this is just real fruit. It's basically fruit, which is freeze-dried. It's ground into a powder, so you got your berries, your strawberries, your apple, all those fruits ground into a powdered form, and then you just rehydrate it and it becomes a delicious smoothie, kind of tastes like a booster juice. You add your powdered milk, maybe add a little bit of honey to it, because honey lasts forever. And I tell you, man, that is a Mad Max smoothie. You could start a business in the apocalypse with that, but we got three skids of the old ones and we're doing 30% off as per the instruction of the distributor who offloaded them to us at a discounted price and we're just passing that discount along to you guys. And if you wanna get the newer ones, well, the newer ones have like a Ziploc thing and you can make them inside the bag. So when you're on the go, these are actually gonna be likely in a lot of military rations soon. So you make it in the bag, it's got a gusset, it's a Mylar bag. Again, last 25 years, this one says 2048. So you can mix it up in the bag. So it's not just, you know, juice crystals, it's actual real fruit. Has an in-depth nutritional breakdown on the back here, all kinds of nutrients in there. So anyways, check it out. I'll post a link in the description. I believe that the discount code is smoothie, okay? I'll post a link in the description for that. Now, according to the US, UN Nas sorry, US National Security, Jake Sullivan, I believe, said this. He said that we can't rule out that Iran will intervene directly in the war in Israel in some way. We are worried about Iran, Hezbollah, and other proxy forces. Again, they wouldn't be mobilizing all of this military equipment for nothing. Not just for Hamas, that's for sure. So we know that this is a lot bigger than that. I think it was to put a lot of these Middle Eastern countries back in check who are starting to drift towards BRICS, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, all these guys are starting to let the money maybe go to their heads from Washington's perspective, and they need to rein them in and show them who still is boss in the world, I guess, but we'll see how long that lasts. Uh, censorship is coming, of course, as many of you know. Uh, they're already starting to censor people who speak out in defense of Palestinian human rights. And, you know, they're conflating this with, you know, advocating for the heinous atrocities that Hamas committed, which obviously is not the case. They are, these are two distinct things, all right? But apparently Meta has permanently deleted the world's largest Palestinian news site, Quds News Network, after 10 years of activity. And dictators, authoritarian governments all over the world, they love a good crisis because they can deprive you of more rights. Myself, personally, I want to hear perspective. I want to hear what the other side has to say, even if I don't agree with it. And we can combat them in the, the marketplace for ideas. People can choose. That's what the free market is all about. We also have the USS George Washington beginning a scheduled six month deployment into where? The Mediterranean Sea. What a surprise. Hamas put out a threatening message today. You probably can't see that on the camera, but it is basically a US warship and uh, it is on fire. And the caption is, we didn't make our missiles and planes just to show off. So they are clearly saying there that uh, what's gonna happen if these aircraft carriers get involved in this fight, that they're gonna be forced to use their anti-ship missiles. And we're gonna see how accurate those anti-ship missiles are and how good American warship defense is. As I said yesterday, the evacuation has been delayed, but now they're starting to evacuate people from the north, in the US that is, and it's about time because every other country has been on that and uh, now you know that it's getting serious because we're actually starting to evacuate our people. As per usual, the government hesitates, they underestimate, and then, of course, they overreact. They underreact, then they overreact. Guys, I got to get some rest because it's going to be a hell of a busy week. I can just imagine. Stock up while you can on what you can because if the price of oil rises during a recession, no less, which is typically not how it's supposed to work, then we're going to see stagflation, the likes of which we've never seen before. So get your gear, 
while the money is still worth something. The price of gold is ticking upwards again. Who knows how high it's going to go. If it continues to go sky high, then I am very concerned because right now the U.S. dollar is still, compared to other currencies, trading very high. So it's not even because the dollar is losing value that the price of gold is going up. Usually there's that inverse correlation between the price of gold and the value of the U.S. dollar. But now the dollar is going up, so the, the money that the gold is measured in is going up and the price of gold is going up. So that tells you that uh, it's worth a lot more, okay, than, than it was, you know, just a month ago, above and beyond the, the nominal value that we see, which is what, 1940 right now, I believe. So something to keep in mind. And, uh, you know, things could pop off really, really fast. I think we've, we've wargamed all the possible scenarios, but of course, something always blindsides us in this uh, grand geopolitical chessboard. We can't possibly see all the moves ahead, but I'd like to know what you guys think about all this. If you have any intel that you would like to share with me, there's a email in my, on my main page. Go and send me it, please. It's just for intel, so if you have very important intel, then share it, but if it's just, you know, like personal opinion and saying hello and stuff like that, then maybe, you know, now is not the time because we're just being bombarded with messages right now. So, but I do appreciate all the support. I appreciate sharing the videos. And uh, yeah, get 30% off our Copia smoothies. You know, this is gonna be money in the year 2048. Let me just cut open a pack here and uh, I'll show you what they, so you get 12 of these in there. And uh, like that is the perfect, these ones are bigger than the, the newer ones. So this is actually a pound of fruit. The newer ones are half a pound of fruit. And uh, it's just the perfect size to put into a backpack or for trade, barter, something like that. And uh, yeah, it's just uh, a super food. You can get green, uh, green power, tropical power, or red. They all have their different pros and cons. Green, uh, as much as it might not taste the best to some people, it's the one that's the most nutrient dense. So I just encourage people to get a mixture of all three. There's variety packs. Uh, if you're somebody who's really big on just nutrition, go with the green. If you're somebody who really likes the taste factor, you know, you can't go wrong. For kids also, kids love these. My kids absolutely love these smoothies, okay? And uh, it's something healthy that you can put inside their, their uh, lunch kit for school instead of that processed crap that you get from the store. Anyways, gear up while you can, my friends, because 90 seconds to midnight, so I'm told. Although I think that uh, they underestimate the world right now. Thanks for watching. Canadian Pepper out.